Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am, as always, very happy to be with you for another episode of the podcast. Hope your week is going well so far. Hope you had a good weekend. Um, the, the strange thing about continuing to m- mainly stay home is that uh, my weekends feel like my weekdays, and so I'm always like, what did I do on my weekend? But... I did actually get caught up on a few things this week, and which made me very happy, and I was able to do some crocheting, which I am very behind on, <laughs> and hopefully I can get some things done because Christmas is coming. So that was my weekend, getting ca- caught up, hanging out with the hubby, doing some crochet, you know, all good stuff. I have, of course, an author interview for you today, and this one is really good timing because this week is Veterans Day, and this is a historical fiction book set in World War II. The author is Samuel Marcus, and the book is called Soldiers of Freedom. Soldiers of Freedom is the true story of the 1944-45 war in occupied Europe and the final Allied struggle to conquer Nazi Germany. The story is told through the eyes of William McBurney, a tank gunner in the 761st Tank Battalion, the first African-American tank unit in World War II. Dynamic General George S. Patton, commander of the U.S. Third Army, and Angela Lang, a 16-year-old German resistance fighter with the anti-Nazi Edelweiss pirates in Cologne. While Patton's forces liberate France and Belgium, fight in the grueling Battle of the Bulge, and cross the Rhine to conquer Germany, U.S. tanker William McBurney and his Black Panthers must fight two wars at once, one against the German army, the other against the racism of their fellow white soldiers. Meanwhile, as the Allies drive into Germany, Edelweiss pirate Angela Lang must survive the Allied bombing of Cologne while she engages in fierce resistance against the Hitler Youth and Nazis and is hunted down by the Gestapo. The real-life heroism of the 761st Black Panthers and legendary Patton to liberate Europe and the Edelweiss pirates to combat Nazism comes to life in this historically accurate tale of the final epic struggle in World War II Europe. So that is the description of Soldiers of Freedom and Uh, You know, as I said, it's very appropriate since Veterans Day is this week and we will be celebrating those who have served past and present. Um, And I, first of all, the level of research that went into this book is amazing and it is so detailed and so rich with the story. But also it's historical fiction, but it's based on real people. So William McBurney, um, real person, I believe um, Sam says that he is no longer living, but he uh, was a real person. He fought in this first African-American tank battalion. Um, Angela, the the Edelweiss pirate character, is actually a composite of some characters, and Sam will explain more about that as we go through it. But everything is, is really based in historical fact, and so it's historical fiction simply because, you know, there are some things that you have to fill in that you can't always know when it comes to historical fiction, but uh, it is really well researched and it is, um, well, it's fascinating because I did not know about either of these groups and I feel fairly well versed in World War II history. You know, if you're a regular listener that I love books set in this time period, but it's such a broad time frame and uh, the scope of of World War II is just huge because you know it it took place across the world and there are so many different stories and different settings that you can talk about so um, I was really 
interested to learn about um, Patton's Panthers and and uh, the Edelweiss Pirates, I didn't even have an inkling of. And I talked to my parents and they said, nope, we've never heard it, of it either. Actually, everyone that I've spoken to, some of them have heard of Patton's Panthers, but no one so far that I've spoken with about this book has heard of the Edelweiss Pirates. So really cool to learn about something else that I, that I didn't know about in terms of World War II history. So I can say thank you to Samuel Marquis for uh, bringing these things to my attention so I could learn something new. Let's go ahead and turn to the interview now and learn more about Soldiers of Freedom from the author himself, Samuel Marquis. Samuel, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. I am very excited to have you here. We are here to talk about your latest historical fiction book. It's called um, Soldiers of Freedom. Before we get to the book and the series, though, if you could share a bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Okay. Yes, I'm a uh, I'm a, a practicing hydrogeologist, and you know I work as an expert witness in the environmental industry, testifying in, in groundwater cases, and um, and and also you know working in environmental consulting to kind of clean up uh, hazardous waste sites. And I also you know obviously write uh, you know historical fiction novels. Uh, I've written 11 of them, and um, several of them have received a, a awards for, uh, you know, either in, in historical fiction or in the history kind of categories. And so, uh, really, um, you know, I kind of wear two hats, but really writing is my true passion. And it's specifically in historical fiction, uh, colonial America, World War II, the American West. Um, and all those areas are what, what I'm really passionate about. And um, speaking of World War II, that's what that's uh, the time period that this book is set in, and it's actually part of a series. Um, you've you've written multiple books uh, about World War II. Can you can you give? Um, they're standalone. They're standalone bo books, but can you can you talk about um, the series sort of as a whole? Yeah, they, I, you know, my, my, uh, my dad and my father's, I mean, excuse me, my, my wife's father both served in World War II. And so I, you know, I grew up, you know, hearing World War II stories and watching a lot of World War II movies. So it was always something that always interested me. So I've written five books in my World War II series. Um, they are all standalone and they're not specifically chronologic, but, you know, they could be, you know, read in chronologic order you know, if you want sort of the flavor of the war. Um, and so uh, I try and now, I initially started out kind of doing historical fiction um, with, uh, you know, a lot of historical figures, but also some fictionalized characters. And then the last, as I evolved, I kind of was like, well, I really want to just tell the true story. And I really try and stick to the, you know, hue to the, um, you know, the actual events would happen. So my, my first book was more historical fiction revolving around a kind of fictionalized idea of a countdown to D-Day and, you know, the Enigma Code. And then the last three really have been pretty much pure history books, really. Yes, you have to, you know, you have to supply some um, some dialogue and some, you know, in the, in the few scenes that I have where, you know, it might be just an introspective, you know, character going through his thoughts and, and things like that. But really 90% of it is just pure history. And I try and take the actual historical figures and, and not use fictionalized characters unless I absolutely have to. Uh, the current book is called Soldiers of Freedom. And it's uh, a true story about two groups that people may or may not be very familiar with. So there's um, Patton's Panthers, as well as um, the Edelweiss Pirates, which is the best name ever. <laughs> um, so let's start with let's start with the Panthers. Can can you talk about uh, that group and why you decided to feature it in this book? Yeah, the so my new, latest book, Soldiers of Freedom, is the fifth in my World War II series, and it really you know I, I initially wanted to do Patton's Panthers, who are the 761st Tank Division, which is the first African-American 
tank division in United States history that, that fought in battle. There had never been a, a black tank unit before. And uh, to be quite honest, you know, uh, the American military and, you know, government, uh, you know, try to do everything that, to do to not have this unit, except for just, you know, they'd be training. And it was basically Eleanor Roosevelt who pushed it hard. And without her, it would have never even happened. But she was insistent that black Americans get to serve in the military in fighting roles and not just being in supply and cooks and stevedores and all the other offloaders and things like that, truckers. And so she really pushed for it. The military was reluctant, but Leslie McNair, a general, white guy, did the right thing, which you always find these in the, in the history of, you know, of these you know, revolutions where we're trying to get equality, you know, there's there's a lot of good white guys behind it too, which is important to know. Patton, for instance, and McNair, uh, you know, and you know, eventually pushed for the to have black black tankers in the US armed forces. So I wanted to write that book and I had that in my head. And then I wanted to have the on the ground resistance fighter. Um, but I wasn't sure if it would take place in in uh in uh, Eastern France, uh, the, or the, the, excuse me, yeah, the northeast corner of France, somewhere in there, or, or Belgium, or Germany. And I, so I was kind of trying to, well, how can I have them? Because the problem is the patent forces moved so fast, and the Panthers didn't come into the picture until November, so at, well after the Normandy invasion. So I was grappling with, you know, I wanted this, you know, I wanted to have some resistance fight on the ground, so I was kind of going with the French resistance initially. And then they just didn't, the, the troops were just moving too fast, and there was just not enough resistance at that point became kind of secondary for the French. So kind of after D-Day, there wasn't nearly as much activity by the French resistance because the Allied troops just moved across France so fast. And so then I stumbled upon the Edelweiss Pirates. Um, it's just like, you know, I don't know, I just came across them by Google searching. And I was like, God, these guys are cool. And they, you know, German resistance? Who are these youth rebelling against Hitler? What an incredible concept that is. No one's ever heard of them. I've never heard of them. And so then I, I just meshed that into the into the story. And so that I could build around and then and I realized the parallels between between, you know, black persecution uh during World War Two of the troops, you know, against their own white troops, not just against the end of German en enemy. And then the Edelweiss pirates who were fighting their own, you know, who were fighting their own oppression from, you know, the Nazis who were be persecuting them for, you know, just kind of being, and they were basically kind of anti-war and also just rebellious against Nazism, you know. So I, once I fit that in, I just blended it in as best I could to tell the story, kind of two independent stories that then coalesced. And I am one of the people that had not heard of the Edelweiss Pirates. I'm um, also fascinated by World War II history and um, have read a lot about the period. I was actually a history major in college, but had not heard of this group. So uh, I was really intrigued. I, I mentioned it to my parents the other day, and they hadn't heard it. So I'm probably going to be passing on the book to them <laughs> so they can they can read it as well. Um, but let's talk about the two characters from these these groups. So we'll start with William. He is the young black man in the book. Can he and he's he's a real person. So can you talk a little bit about William? Yeah. So uh, William William McBurney was you know in his late teen when he signed up. You know he was actually uh, you know had just turned eighteen. He wanted to sign up before, but his dad wouldn't let him. Dad had fought in World War One. And so I took this uh, character, William McBurney, who was in other books. The, 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 some of the books that, uh, you know, greatly affected my story were Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's book on the black uh, 761st Tank Battalion. And he had a, a fair amount on McBurney in there because his father, uh, you know, he's, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's original name was Lou Alcindor. And his father, uh, uh, you know, Alcindor, was in the army and he was good friends with Leonard Smith, who was the best friend of William McBurney, very close friend during World War II. And they ended up, you know, saving each other and getting each other through the war. Well, this guy, 
uh, you know, Schmitty's father was best friends with, with Al Sender, who was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's father, who served in the war. So I had a fair amount on McBurney from that book, and then, you know, some of the other books I got, I, I had enough on him to make him the lead character and sort of the voice of the 761st Tank Division, and a battalion, excuse me. And so, you know, I just built a story around him and so that, you know, you per to personalize it. And also he was an interesting, you know, he's a kid. He's, I think he's either just passed away or, or, you know, or, you know, getting up there in years, but he may still be alive, which is amazing because he, he, he showed up at all the events for years. And, uh, and so it, it's just an interesting, he was just an interesting story to build it around. Yeah, he sounds fascinating, and and the the connection, the the fact that you you learned about him from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's book, that is, I I just think that's really cool, uh, the connections in there. So, what about William? Do you think is going to resonate with readers? I think he's he's just like my dad was at the war. He's almost the same. He was born, um, you know, around the same time. Um, and he's just a kid. I mean, he's a kid who lived in, who lived in, uh, you know, Hell's Kitchen, New York, you know, back in, you know, so you're, you're talking about right after the, you know, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. And he's just a guy, just like all the guys who wanted to go fight for his country. And he didn't, you know, he, he wanted to be a, he wanted to be a pilot though. He was the, he, he read a thing in the, in the New York Post or the New York Times about, you know, opportunities for black guys in the air, you know in the air corps it's called the air corps then and and uh you know so he went into the recruiting station in lower manhattan to sign up for that and he was told it's my first scene in my book so i played it out almost exactly you know exactly but everything that, that we know was said and he was told no you can't do that you know you're and why not well you know and he kept saying he wouldn't say because you're black He's just like, well, we just we can't do that, son, you know, and you know that's how it was. And so, but the guy at least was nice, helpful enough to say, well, with this tank corps, there's this new tank group coming up, you could try, you could try that. So he signed up for that, and he got in the tank corps because he, he first of all, he was already pre-screened because you, you had to be, he had to take the aptitude test, and he's all these black tankers were exceptional you know, exceptionally smart guys that had to make it through to score high. He had to score a certain, uh, you know, get a certain point percentage in that test to even get to be a tanker, you know. He, otherwise, you'd be a foot soldier, you know, an infantryman and, and not have any choice or be thrown in the Navy. And so, he, you know, like my dad was. And so he, you know, so he got in the tank group because he was smart. And he was, you know, proved to be a very talented gunner. So he came in as a tank gunner operating a 75 millimeter 76 millimeter cannon on the tank on the sherman tanks i mean they didn't train on sherman tanks they didn't have you know kind of crummy tanks to begin with but eventually he was fighting in shermans when he was in northeastern france belgium and in germany so he was a kid a new york kid growing up um you know and and just an average guy he played some football you know, got to know Jackie Robinson in my book, which is he's a character, and uh, and so I think he's just. What's great about him is he's just a, a real, just average guy who became a hero, and probably just wanted to do his job. He wanted to serve his country, and that's it. It was as simple as that. He just wanted to get right. that chance. Right. Yep. Uh, have you spoken with his family, or what? What sort of what sorts of research did you do? Um, to his his role in the book, I actually I didn't reach out to you know because it's right I'm writing technically I'm writing historical fiction even though I'm trying to write as accurately as possible so I didn't reach out to you know to I, I checked out their website the 761st Tank Battalion website but that was that was headed up by Joe Wilson who wrote a great book on the 761st Tank Division or Battalion excuse me I keep saying that. And, and, um, but it, it had ended in kind of the, you know, around 2011, I think. So there weren't enough guys alive still, unfortunately, 
uh, in the battalion. And so the website had kind of been discontinued. But, um, but Joe Wilson was nice enough to recommend me to a, a French World War II author recently who emailed me because he wants to get his book published in the U.S. And I you know, sent him some information as much as I could to help him. So Joe Wilson, whose father was in the 761st Tank Battalion and has done a lot to help and, and, and publicize and bring attention to the battalion, uh, Patent Panthers, you know, with his book and also on the website, because he was kind of the, the administrator of the website, did recommend me to, so, so there's people out there who are getting the book, but it's probably the sons of the battalion, because there's just not many of them left, unfortunately. Well, it is a it is a fascinating story and not one that gets highlighted very often, as is the other the other part of the story with the Edelweiss pirates. Now, Angela is the um, the character that is part of the Edelweiss pirates, and she is more of a, a of a composite of real people. Is that correct? Yes, I unfortunately I wanted to ba base the character originally on. Uh, on Mucky Koch, who was a real Edelweiss pirate woman. Unfortunately, she was imprisoned and tortured and had to move around so much, I couldn't keep it in one centralized place. So I did make this, that character is fictionalized in a composite of, um, of really several characters. So she's kind of based on, uh, uh, Bartholomew Schenk, Bartholomew Schenk, who's who has a street named after him and a plaque. Who's who? Um, in the book, I also made her boyfriend is kind of based on Bartholomew Schenk too. So I kind of made you know those two together, kind of telling the story of the Ada Weiss pirate. So she's based on loosely you know Mucky Koch, and um, but also with a, some some of the events that uh, Bartholomew Schenk went through. And and um, Jean Julich, who also was, uh, you know, in, in the mix. Who actually, I made him the real character, but some of the incidents kind of that the, the mucky goes through is really kind of, you know, uh, sort of hybridized of, of based on three characters. So the events are real, the character is fictionalized, but based loosely on on one uh, primary female character. We're going to go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. I hope that you are enjoying learning all of this um, interesting, all these interesting facts about World War II, or maybe you already knew some of them, but um, now you're learning more. I don't know. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the Edelweiss Pirates. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible Study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Samuel Marquis about his historical fiction book, the uh, fifth in the series. It's called Soldiers of Freedom. And can you talk a little bit about um, the Edelweiss Pirates and Angela's role within them? Because it, you speak a little bit in um, the afterword of the book about how there's, it's not a well-known group and also what's, what was known about them that it was kind of, um, underplayed or dismissed a little bit, but they have been in recent, um, recently acknowledged as, as an actual resistance group. So can you talk a little bit about the Edelweiss Pirates? Yeah, what happened to the Edelweiss Pirates is initially they were, you know, they were initially kind of started out as just rebellious youth who wanted to, who were, you know, you know, most of them were anti-Nazi, but some of them weren't even 100% anti-Nazi. They just wanted to be not be put in with you know, work groups at the front 
and not be sort of dictated to with this educational program that was so heavily Nazified, you know, where everything was subverted to the state. So some of them were just wanted, you know, they just wanted to be kids, you know, teenagers growing up and independent. So it started out, they, they take guitars and go in the countryside around Cologne and some of the other cities, um, Dusseldorf and Hamburg and all these other cities, really the Western, more progressive part of Germany. And, and so they, you know, they would go up, go in the woods and kind of camp out and sing songs and they'd sing kind of anti-Nazi songs. And it was, they'd go there on the weekends originally and they did this in the, like in the mid thirties it began. Well, that continued and continued. And then the, you know, the, you know, the Nazis didn't even want them doing that. So they would round them up, you know, shave their heads, put them in jail for a day or two to scare them. You know, back, back then they were just sort of regarded as just sort of rebellious kids. And Himmler and his SS, you know, they were on the radar, but they weren't brutal to them. But they'd abuse them. And then they were fighting the Hitler Youth, too, then. So the kids were, you know, these Edelweiss pirates originally, um, you know, the Cologne Navajos, there were different groups. And the, the other, they had other names. The Edelweiss pirates is just the umbrella of all the different groups name for all the different groups and so they would sort of re rebel against the hitler youth and they would actually fight them on the street sometimes as the war as the war began and escalated and the allies approached closer and closer once especially once they got a told in normandy they ramped up their their rebellion and they you know then they started bombing and stealing at a higher rate you know stealing weapons, fighting in the streets, actually fighting with the Gestapo sometimes, and doing a lot more, you know, derailing train. You know, they did more and more, became more and more a resistance group and not just sort of a teen rebellion group. When the war ended, they weren't necessarily all pro-American. You know, they kind of viewed them as sort of, you know, or pro-British especially as being a little bit imperial and going to come in and, and treat Germany badly, you know. And so they didn't just jump on the bandwagon. They, they offered their services to the Allies in rooting out the Nazis, but that, that was denied. You know, they, they didn't, you know, the, the Allies wanted to think that every German was evil. They wanted all the Germans to be lumped under sort of hit, not the Nazi banner. And, and they sort of had difficulty understanding, you know, that there were, was German resistance. And the British in particular didn't really want to give credit to it. So that's why, that's why, you know, Valkyrie and those plots, even if they had taken out Hitler, probably might not have amounted to much, you know, because Himmler would have just taken over in Goering. So really there was a lot of denial on the part of the Allies for giving credit to these, you know, these, you know, resistance fighters. Because now today they're viewed as resistance fighters or, or at least, you know, resistance group, you know, they, you know, for what they did and you know they have now they've been you know honored and it took a long time just like the just like the uh patent panthers the 761st tank battalion you know they weren't recognized until the carter administration the, the two groups um the as i mentioned before is patent panthers and the edelweiss pirates are possibly even probably not well known to a lot of people especially the edelweiss pirates um, and so I was actually excited to learn something new. It's one of my fascinations with this time period is that the war was so vast in scope and there are so many different stories from all over the world. Is that something that is important to you when you sit down to write a historical fiction that you highlight something that maybe is not well known or does that just tend to come out in the writing process? That's a good question. I've kind of gone a little bit both ways um my thing is to try and be get the history very as accurate as i can and so you know and still make it as much of a page turner as i can you know i still try and make it you know i write write it like a suspense novel but i try and make it all the history is accurate the dialogue is always built around known dialogue of people unless it's unless it's kind of the event of two lovers together alone you know, and then that's kind of the made up kind of stuff that, you know, that, that lovers would normally have, you know, or husband and wife or whatever, or, you know, or two, 
you know, two gay lovers or whatever it would be in, in the book. And so um, I try and stick to history as accurately as I can. But then what I do is I pick what I think are the most dynamic events in that person's life. And I also make everything character driven. So all of my books are three to six point of view characters, a balance of male and female, different ages. So in this one, you get Patton. You know, you get the, you know, General Patton. And, and for him, almost everything is just historically documented. McBurney, most stuff is, you know, virtually. And then Angela, I'd take a little more, little more liberties, but I make all the, the historical events are accurate and, and accurately depicted as I can. And the people that were there were the right people, you know, all the right people. And Angela is more of a composite character, though. And so really the key is I try and pick things, maybe that history's overlooked, but also people that have been overlooked in history. So Spies of the Midnight Sun is, a, is really about Eddie, um, Eddie Chapman, who uh, was a safe cracker who became a world-class spy and is the model for James Bond. Not everybody knows about Eddie Chapman. I picked that guy out. And then two Norwegian resistance fighter women who have been totally overlooked by history and were considered to be, uh, you know, like to, they, they, were, they were ostracized for su supporting the Germans when they were actually fighting against them and they were spies. But, you know, when you're a spy, sometimes not everybody knows it. And so they were betrayed by their countrymen, their Norwegians, and they were resistant, you know, women who were, you know, exceptional. So I told that story because those people were unheralded. They should have been remembered for what they did and they weren't. Then my next book, Lions of the Desert, which is the fourth in the series, I is, is a straight ahead, uh, you know, basically the story of Operation Condor in the North African desert. And it's the, um, the it's basically the true story of the English patient, the movie and the book. Um, because that, that author actually didn't tell the true story. It's actually, he made it pretty much a fictionalized account that's boost, based very loosely on the actual event. I took that, the English patient, and told the real story in my book, um, you know, Lions of the Desert. So that's the fourth in the series. So that one, I was kind of like, I wanted to make sure they hit, you know, correct. It's, first of all, I thought it was a great spy story and romantic and North African desert and, you know, British agents and German agents and Rommel. And so that, I wanted to tell that story, but I wanted to make it accurate. You know, because the English patient, it just wasn't the real story. But I love the English patient. I love the movie, but it's just not real. And so then my last book, you know, I did, again, I wanted to just tell the real story of Patton, McBurney, and the Edelweiss Pirates, you know, um, through Angela, or, you know, uh, Mucky Koch, but, but unfortunately she was in prison so much, like I said before, and had to kind of hide out on a farm for like several months. Um, and so I kind of couldn't have her where I needed her to be. So that's why I had to Unfortunately, he's a fictional character there, even though I didn't want to. Will there be a sixth book in the series? Yes, I I think right now I'm I'm writing the I'm the ninth grade grandson of Captain Kidd, William Kidd, the privateer, and so I'm writing a book now because I really want to get that story out there. So I'm taking a little break from World War II since I've written kind of five books in the series now, and writing this book on my ancestor, Captain Kidd. But I will do a sixth book. And, and to be honest, I had actually started it when I decided, switched ideas and decided to do Captain Kidd. And so I kind of have the sixth book and even the seventh book in the series in my head already because I think them out before I, long before I start them. And I really start reading up. So I usually gear up a couple years before on ideas that I like. And then I just feel like, you know, I have to make sure I, the characters I can – you know, I can not fictionalize them as much as I, you know, so I can, I, so there's enough known about them. You know, I need a certain amount of information to be able to tell the story, you know. And you mentioned the, the book about William Kidd. Is this um, something that you've known all your life? Is it passed down in the family or is it something you found out through like um, ancestry or, or, or something like that? How, how has that story come into fruition? Oh, and no, we've, uh, I've grown up, we've, I've always been grown up knowing I was the ninth grade grandson of Captain Kidd. We've been talking about him since I was a little kid. Um, and, and then we, you know, there is the, 
you know, the genealogy backs it up in terms of, and we luckily in our, our family has, uh, you know, some top researchers, uh, Professor David Boyles of the uh, South Dakota School of Mines and, and, and sort of, he's a, you know, genealogist. So he sort of tracks all that. And then we've had, uh, you know, other people in the family that are, you know, one, someone wrote a 780 page thing outlining all the ancestral things. So it's been well established since I was a little kid. What, the thing is, I grew up on stories of them that were totally true, untrue though. Because everything I learned, oh, he was a pirate. He was the most, you know, vicious pirate of all time. And obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that. Pirates, privateers, excuse me, you know, were, and, and pirates were an integral part of the growth of colonial America. It was basically, uh, people think of pirates as these, you know, rogues who live were social isolates and didn't have families and stuff. That's totally false. They were like, guys who wanted to go out and strike it rich, young guys or older guys who were just seamen who had families and smuggling and piracy were part of the very fabric of, of colonial America. As a matter of fact, we wouldn't have had it, made, they wouldn't have been survived economically without it. In New York was prominent, in Boston, the Puritans were, you know, had, they, you know, they looked the other way for smuggling and piracy too. You know, of course, they'd lock up pirates when, you know, when they were, when, you know, when they, when they had to and were sort of for, forced, but they looked away on a lot of stuff. Charleston, uh, you look at, you know, Rhode Island was the biggest pirate stronghold in colonial America. So it was really part of the growth of America, which is interesting. See, that's why I like, I like to learn and tell the real history because the history you learn in school is a lot of times largely wrong, or at least tells only half the story. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, are you working on just a standalone novel? Will this be a series? How are you envisioning telling his story? Well, I kind of, I, I have enough material that I would envision kind of a, I might do a series of books on privateers and pirates in colonial America. So I haven't given a thought. I'm going to do this book now, uh, this book that I'm doing now. And, and, I, and I'm, and I'm going to do it as narrative nonfiction too. Because it's just I want to just just tell the story accurately, but I'm also writing the, uh, the historical fiction version too, which is I'm kind of doing that first, and then I'm going to tell a narrative nonfiction. And I don't know which one I'm going to go with. I'm going to have to make a decision. But um, I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get the accurate story, but I also wanted to do. I had already started it in my style of historical fiction, so I'm going to get that done first, and then do the narrative nonfiction version. But it will be the first pirate book, you know, quote unquote pirate book, uh, written that I know of by the descent, direct descendant of a pirate. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Because I haven't seen one yet. Interesting. So, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm kind of upset, consumed with it right now. Like, you know, I'm, I'm getting all the primary references, and with COVID, you know, I'm getting, taking some work to get some things from Q in London. So, uh, mm -hmm. But I have almost, you know, 90% of it, and it's going well. It's just a great it story. Sounds, yeah, it sounds really interesting. Let's go ahead and take our second break of the podcast. As we go to that break, I will say that my mom has done a ton of work on our family's history and genealogy and ancestry and all of that good stuff. And there is um, there is no one famous in my family tree. <laughs> Lots of interesting people, but no one famous. So I, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, do you have anyone famous in your family tree? I'd love to hear about it. You are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Sam was talking about the new book or books that he is working on based on his ancestor, William Kidd. And um, so now let's go ahead and talk about uh, the amount of research that has to go into these books that he writes. For this book and and your other books, um, I imagine there's a lot of research that goes into that. Um, How much research do you generally do before you start writing? I usually read, you know, I mean, sometimes it's like years in the making, like Blackbeard, you know, my agent wanted me to do it a long time ago. And, and then I, and I kept like, well, you know, we're doing these other things that kind of went ahead of it. And then, so I'd thought about that for years before I wrote Blackbeard. So I've already written one pirate book. And, and um, I, what I wanted to do is take the new, what I do is I take the newest research and all the historical documents, you know, I get my hands on everything I can get, you know, like, you know, my World War II books, I'm getting the CIA files and the British Secret Service files, MI5 file, you know, detailed. And, the, you know, and I, and I get some, you know, the ones in Nor- Norwegian and German that have been translated. And um, so I get as much primary material as I can get my hands on. I've had to do a little more with Captain Kidd just because I'm doing a narrative, non, you know, I'm doing a nonfiction book now. So it has to be as good as any, you know, nonfiction book that's ever been written on my ancestor. The difference is that it'll be written by an ancestor, Captain Kidd, and I'm telling his story. So, you know, I'm sympathetic, but I'm tough on him too. You know, it's, when, it's, when it's your ancestor, all of a sudden you're like, the events strike you, you know, harder. You know, you're definitely, the emotion level's up. But at the same time, you hold them to a high standard because you, you know, they kind of, you know, you're a descendant of them. So you, you don't want them to, you know, to, you kind of like, God, why'd you do that? You know, <laughs> you know, and part of it's just our time is so vastly different. You know, people were, you know, dramatically different then. And you, you can't hold them to the standards of today. That's, that's wrong. That's the wrong way to do history. So you can hold them only to the standards that existed in their time, you know. So, you know, with some exceptions. Um, so it, it is an exciting thing to take history and try and do it accurately. And I try and be as accurate as I can, but it's still kind of my interpretation of history to some extent. But I try and be as fair and balanced, and most, most of my readers acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. They like the historical accuracy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's a good way for people to learn something that they may not know or learn more about a topic that they, you know, are interested in. Um, but with the, with the underlying story, especially with historical fiction, with that underlying story, it can be, it can be a little easier to learn um, rather than reading just a straight textbook or a history book. Yeah, but I'm going to write Captain Kidd as narrative nonfiction. So believe me, it's going to read, it's going to read my, my historical novels, a lot of people, to be honest, I want in a history category. I want in a historical nonfiction category for one of them. You know, my, my, you know, it was entered in that and entered in that by my publicist and it won. I mean, so, so that's how accurately I'm trying to stick to history in my historical fiction. But I'm going to take it up a little notch, you know, with have proper footnoting in this book on Captain Kidd because I want it to be you know, as good as any book that's ever been written on them, but with the latest, the, the, the last 20 years of research, you know. You know, Absolutely. and it's written yeah. by, you know, the, the ninth great grandson of Captain Kidd. You know, that's kind of the, you know, something that I can bring to the table. Mm-hmm. In terms of writing, is it something that you always wanted to do growing up or did you come to it later in life? How did that work for you? No, I always wanted to, I always loved writing, and I just, you know, I, I probably when I was young, I was kind of a, kind of a sort of wild, you know, athletic boy, probably had too much energy, and so I, you know, I wanted, I probably wanted to be a writer more than I was good at it, until I just remember being read aloud in like sixth grade by the teacher in front of the whole class. For the first, you know, and I wrote this thing, and I had a, you know, I still remember it. 
you know, it began like on a father kind of day with leaves and, and, you know, your father's out there raking the leaves and I'm jumping in them. And it was very, and I was like, the teacher read it and everyone went, oh, you know, and I was like, God, I'm actually, I can, might be good at this. It was the first time little, you know, the teachers can have, you know, you forget these little events in your life that could be life transforming. And that was one for me. And so I wrote my first novel in high school. It was terrible. I wrote it out on like, you know, this is, you know, showing my age a little bit, but I, those big 11 by 17 yellow pads, you know, you know, back then, you know, not everything was typed up, you know, so, and it was terrible, but I wrote a novel, you know, my first kind of novel in high school. And I just, you know, I always, I took a lot of English classes, even though I was a geology major in college. So I always wanted to write. It was always kind of, I was always kind of like, well, you know, you got to make a living son. And then, but well, but I really wanted to be a writer. And then, you know, finally, I just started doing it, you know, kind of had two careers, you know. Um, so it was always in there. It was I, from an early age. And, you know, I always wanted and I was, took a lot of English classes, but I wasn't actually a journalism or, a, you know, writing major or English major, you know, in college. Mm -hmm. But I published a lot of papers, too. I guess I should say that, I, you know, I published maybe 25 peer review papers and journals. And now I've published 11 books. You know, that takes a fair amount of, you know, drive to to do that many books and that many peer review papers in scientific journals and publish mm -hmm. a master's thesis. I published my master's thesis in the American Association of Petroleum Geologists back in the day when, you know, back when really only PhDs were kind of publishing it. So it obviously I was wanted to be, a, you know, the writing, whether it was technical writing or, you know, more fiction writing. I always liked writing and the process of creating. Yeah, thank you for that. Out of your own experience then, would you have advice for aspiring authors? Um, do I have a site for them or I help, I actually can you remember that again? That yeah, yeah, do you have advice for aspiring authors, especially oh, people who are looking to write historical fiction? Oh yeah, I mean, I think I've written so. I've, as a matter of fact, I forgot to say too. I've written a not large number of articles since I've, you know, been writing the last, you know, decade or so. And so I do. I've published a lot of writer uh, articles on, um, on historical fiction writing. So if you Google my name, some of them will come up. But the one thing I say, I think, which, and not everybody would agree with this, but I think it's really important to stick to the history, and just take the most important events most life-changing events were dramatic, and then highlight those. So, so I try and recreate every scene I can and make it pure history. Of course, there's some added dialogue. Of course, you're thinking their thoughts. Of course, you're thinking, you know, there's some liberties in there, but I'm almost always true to the exact dialogue. And I take it from their journals. Like, you know, Patton had a, you know, wrote a whole, kept a journal throughout the war. And so you have every day of him, his thoughts and what he thinks and stuff. So, you know, I try and take as much of those. And Rommel kind of did the same thing. So some of the major people of history, you know, I get a lot from their journals or even articles. McBurney, I got a fair amount after the war because he's been in the news and you can hear what he had to say. So I take his, what he might have said in, you know, 19, 2002, you know, but it, it's relevant to something he talks about in the past, and I take his words there and put them in in the book where I can't, where I think they, you know, would belong. I'm still taking his words, but I'm taking them, you know, a little bit later after his life because I don't have as much. He didn't have a, he didn't leave a journal, you know. So I think what I, I guess what I would say for aspiring, um, you know, historical fiction authors is. Just go try and pick a event that you that that you find important and characters that you can stand behind because I love my characters, my villains even too. I you know I, I I pick guys who are you know even my villains I pick guys who are great who have shown some great even some of the you know you some of the guys who are in the SF I pick guys who are deliberately gray and are sort of intriguing and even go to the other side a little bit. You know, they go both ways. They're not pure Nazis. You'd be surprised at, at the gray areas, even for 
you know, some German guys during World War II. Um, you know, and so I think the key is historical accuracy. Pick characters that you really can stand behind that have enough history that you can not take endless liberties. Either that, or you know, some people write historical fiction that's not really history. It's just it takes place during historical events, but it's completely fictionalized people. And I'd say, you know, the way that he wrote the Incas patients that, you know, that's not, it's really fiction. There's almost none, very little of the history did he actually stick to. So it's almost really, can't really almost call that historical fiction, I'd say. So I think you want to take it a notch and be a little more historically accurate because then you can say, hey, it's as accurate as I can make it. And then except for the dialogue and some of the, the intimate scenes behind, you know, where someone's being consoled or, or they're with their, you know, their lover, or, you know, you have to take a few liberties there and sort of recreate their character, but it has to be consistent with their character. And, and I would say the last thing, the most important thing to avoid is don't take a historical character and force them to, to some modern day thing to make him or her look better. You know, don't take away their flaws of their era, you know, if they were, you know, whatever, if they were maybe slaveholders, um, you know, back in colonial times, for instance, you know, everyone did it then. Not, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about during the Civil War and leading up to the Civil War. By then, once Britain and France had discontinued the practice, that was a different story. You know, that's when it was, becomes much more like the taboo and, and downright evil. And it's downright evil to begin with, let's face it. But it's a lot different in 1650 than it is in 1830. Big difference. It's also a big difference on the southern plantation versus up up north, you know, with a, a you know a, a maid versus a field hand. And I'm not trying to say it's not evil because it's evil to begin with. But there is there's shades of gray in certain historical things that people did. I understand, you know, women were treated obviously not nearly as good. So back in the colonial times or that. So for instance, Captain Kidd and his wife were incredibly close. He actually did a lot of things to avoid being, to, to make sure that she was prominent and she went out of her way to help rescue him in his time of trouble. So here's one of the greatest love stories ever written. Captain Kidd and Sarah Kidd, my ninth great grandfather and his wife, and, and they are, you know, remarkable people. And they were fighting, you know, kind of against British oppression, and he was a, you know, a hero for America. He's fighting the French on behalf of colonial America, and and he actually did, you know, like his wife wanted him to stay at home more, and he did. He, you know, he, he, and he, he you know, the, the, some of the things he did are very modern, but you kind of, but you have to be careful in, I think, historical fiction in trying to make it you know, to modernize your characters too much. Because they were different then. We have to accept some of the flawed things they did then as part of their fabric of their culture and not make it fit our modern idea. You know, at the same time, you know, I always try to pick people that were kind of progressive in their era because that's the people I'm drawn to naturally. So, you know, if that's what you need to do it, then pick someone who's, you know, like Harriet Tubman. I mean, she's a hero in any world, right? I mean, you know, here's this incredible woman, black woman, you know, who's going freeing, you know, hundreds of slaves and, and bringing them as almost a scout or a guide across the border through swamps, crossing rivers, going through trees, being hunted down by hounds. And I mean, she's a hero. I mean, an outrageous hero in her era. So, you know, if, if those are the people you're drawn to, then you know, pick those kinds of people, you know, to, to your books. But don't try and modernize them artificially. Okay, time for the last break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll be wrapping up the interview with Sam. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Samuel Marquis. I would imagine that you do a lot of reading when, uh, in terms of research, but when you take time to read just for yourself, what are your favorite authors or genres? Unfortunately, I don't have any reading time to myself at all because I, <laughs> because I have to read so much to write these books. I mean, I've like, I have li- literally read probably a hundred books on Captain Kidd and maybe 500 articles in the last six months. So I have zero time for anything else. But what I like, the people that I like, I like Ben McIntyre who writes World War II and espionage stories. He's British. Um, I love Ron Chernow, you know, who's written on Grant and Washington and Alexander Hamilton. And um, I, there's, I like sort of, I write, read a lot of historical, uh, historical uh, nonfiction is what I read. And uh, so those are two of the guys. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Looking on my bookshelf here because I can't remember. Oh, I like, I like Colin Woodard. I like Rick Atkinson, who's written great World War II thing. Actually, he was influential on in me starting to write these World War II books. Rick Atkinson, he wrote that World War II trilogy. And now he's writing a uh, Revolutionary War trilogy. And so I like him a lot. So those are some of the people. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. And I can't think, you know, I mean, I've read Stephen Ambrose, you know, I like his, some of his World War II stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of who else there is. Oh, a Philbrick, Nathaniel Philbrick. Um, oh, Eric Larson. So I like Eric Larson. So those those are all nonfiction books. So those are the ones that I do read. I guess I read a tiny bit outside of when I'm doing research. But lately, for the last few years, it's been pretty heavy on the research because I just have to I have to read so much to write a historical fiction novel. It's just it's an astronomical amount that you have to kind of take in to really be accurate. Right. Sure. Well, thank you for that. I know you have a website, so if you could um, tell people where to find your website as well as where they might be able to interact with you on social media. Yeah, so my website is just Samuel Mark with books, um, dot com basically. And and if you Google, I guess if you Google me, you'll get a fair amount of stuff because I've written a fair amount of articles and, and had reviews and stuff. Um, so my social media, it's just, it's just Samuel Marcus Books. So I think really if you just go to Samuel Marcus Books, it has all the links. SamuelMarcusBooks.com, you, you know, it'll have kind of my backstory, descriptions of all my books, and it'll have buying links to, uh, you know, indie bookstores, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and all the buying options and stuff. And also links to all my social media too. So I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, I guess I'm on LinkedIn, but I think that's a little more my just geologist profile. Um, so that's kind of where I am. And if you just Google me, if you just Google Samuel Marcus Books, you'll get more information than you need. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> well, we have talked about quite a few different topics today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to mention or bring up? No, I guess we I guess we we kind of talked about Captain Kidd, my newest book early on. Um so we kind of 
covered that. So normally I would have kind of segued to my newest book, um, but I've already done that. But I guess uh, what I want to leave people with is, um, who, you know, especially people who maybe haven't read my books, what I strive for, and I think I've come out and I've kind of said it in this interview, is I really do strive for historical accuracy is, you know, first and foremost, and at the same time, try and make a very suspense driven novel with characters that people will care about, but also tell an interesting story from a historical standpoint. But I do really try and stick to, to, to accuracy. So I think for some people who like to only read historical nonfiction, I think they may be surprised that they read my books that basically you'll find it very similar to the narrative nonfiction of an Eric Larson or a Phil Britt, Nathana Philbrick, or some of these others who are writing, you know, they're writing nonfiction, but they're writing narrative nonfiction, which is, comes very close to historical fiction, at least my historical fiction. So I would just, you know, say that to people that, you know, if you want historical accuracy and sort of, you know, either little known events or people who are overlooked by history, that's kind of what my books try and bring out. All of them, whether it's Blackbeard, Captain Kidd, or, you know, my World War II books in the desert that kind of feature Rommel, or my new book that features Patton. We haven't talked about Patton at all, um, but, you know, the new book is not just McBurney and the Adolph Pirates, but George Patton, who I guess one thing I'd like to leave people with was instrumental in supporting the Black Panthers. The, you know, the 761st Tank Division is called Patton Panthers for a reason, because he asked specifically for them, and he's the first, you know, white combat, you know, general to integrate black, to get black, you know, tankers in his, in the third army. And they were instrumental. And he came out and he spoke to them. He didn't go to speak to every troop, but he went out and spoke to these guys. And they all remember it. It was a memorable, one of the most memorable events of their life. They all talked about Pat. They also said he was, you know, kind of, a, you know, just, you know, it's Pat and he's incredible. And he was, you know, and he's also the first to integrate rifle companies. So he's the first to have black Americans integrated with whites in rifle companies. And he didn't wait for approval. He just did it. So, and, you know, Patton said some dumb things, that, you know, and, and did some dumb things late in the war particularly. Um, some people think that maybe when he was, you know, he was a polo player and he fell off his horse and had some head trauma. So some people think he might have had, you know, um, you know, head, head trauma injury like NFL, you know, players have had. And so sometimes he'd say some, you know, kind of crazy stuff, let's face it. But he was still a great general, legendary general. And he should be remembered for, you know, being the first to have black tankers in his third army and for integrating his, his sharpshooting battalion or sharpshooting companies. So I, I'll leave it a little bit on the note of Pat. All right. Well, thank you for that. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me about not only your World War II books, but also the, the William Kidd books that are coming up. Um, I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for having me. Thank you again to Samuel Marquis for joining me for this interview to talk about not only Soldiers of Freedom, but the uh, some of the other books in his World War II series and his new book uh, about his ancestor, William Kidd. Uh, if you are a fan of historical fiction, if you are a fan of World War II, that time period, you should definitely check this book out. And like I said, it's really um, good timing that this episode is airing the week of Veterans Day. Speaking of Veterans Day, thank you to everyone who has served in my family, um, in my my grandpa Harry, my uncle Dave, my dad, and my oldest niece uh, have all been in the Navy. And my, in fact, my niece is just finishing up her four years in the next week or so, I believe, maybe a couple of weeks. I can't remember the exact date. I'll have to double check on that. But so she has just finished up her, um, her time is finishing up her time and her husband actually finished uh, about a month or six weeks ago uh, although he ruined the streak because she married um she married a marine <laughs> but, but that's okay we love him anyway <laughs> he just ruined my navy 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 streak anyway thank you to uh those members of my family and thank you to everyone who has served it is so very appreciated 
So as always, thank you for joining me and I hope that you will join me for the next interview that will be with um, author Solomon Goldstein Rose. He has written a book called The 100% Solution, A Plan for Solving Climate Change. So this one is nonfiction and he talks a lot about what needs to happen in order to um, ensure that we still have a planet for coming generations. And so it is... It's a bit of a tough read simply because of the, the, the overwhelming feel of this problem, but he works very hard throughout the book to create or, or present solutions that can work. Uh, the 100% solution, he says, as opposed to the 10% solution that, you know, kind of just addresses the immediate needs, but not the long-term effects. So hopefully you'll join me for that episode that interview on the next episode and in the meantime I hope you are having a wonderful week if you are a fan of this podcast please do as I always ask um, write us a nice review five stars are great written is great everything you know is just help us it, it helps us to get word about the podcast out there into the world Thank you for that. And thank you for those of you who follow us on social media. If you do not follow us, I would love to have you follow us. We are um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, GSMC Book Review. Pretty easy to find. So thank you so much for following. But if you don't follow us, please do and interact with me. I love to hear um, I love to hear your stories. I love to hear what you're reading. Uh, just whatever you want to chat about. So thank you so much again for listening and tune in next time. In the meantime, I hope you're having a wonderful week. Make sure you say thank you to the veterans in your life. And I hope that this week involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.